uh, we are really uh, overwhelmed and happy about the, the big interest and response. Actually, we had over 700 uh, registrations. We don't know how many really will uh, connect today. At the moment, there are more than 250. And, um, and um, yeah, we hope that, uh, that for all, um, it will be easy to follow and, uh, and also to ask questions. We, we are not sure whether it will be very easy to answer all the questions, um, but uh, we will try. Um, The background of uh, of this webinar is that um, that um, ICA and IDF are cooperating on animal welfare, actually. And I don't know whether all of you know ICA. ICA is the International Committee for Animal Recording, and we are working on uh, harmonization and standardization of traits. And uh, on behalf of ICA, the ICA Working Group on Functional Traits where I am having the, the, chair, the, the honor of chairing this. Uh, we have the focus more on, on functional traits and, and um, one topic which you might know where we have been working together uh, with experts on claw health and, and lameness is the ICA Claw Health Atlas. And this recent um, publication or a result of this uh, collaboration are guidelines on lameness and actually this is the intention or the, the reason why we are organizing this webinar to get today uh, to present this and to give a, a background on, on lameness, to, to raise awareness for lameness, but also um, show examples and, pro and approaches how these guidelines uh, can be uh, used in, in, in practice. And, uh, and lameness is one part or one important trait in, um, in, in animal welfare. And uh, in the topic of animal welfare and animal-based parameters, we are working together with um, IDF. And uh, actually it's the, the second webinar in this cooperation. The first one was in, gen in general on animal-based uh, welfare parameters. And um, we are... Um, Really happy that uh, we found um, very, um, very well known and, ex um, and experienced speakers. Um, um, to... Sorry, Cesare? It... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. My fault. Okay. Sorry, Is my there a fault. Problem? Okay. Uh, for, the, for the program uh, we have put together is um, that. Um, that first there will be a presentation from Nicola Go. She's the communication manager from, from IDF uh, on tools and practices to disseminate animal health. Then we will have a general introduction in lameness at the uh, Global Dairy Challenge from Professor uh, John Huxley from Messe University. And then Anne-Marie Christen from Lactanet will present the new guidelines for recording lameness in, in dairy cattle, which was uh, elaborated with um, different experts um, from from all over the world, and uh, and then uh, Nick Bell will bring um, more the aspect on uh, lame scoring, um, improving consistency, accuracy, and ma managing expectation, and having also the focus more on 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 practical um, implementation, and then. Uh, we want to take time for discuss, discussion and questions. Uh, just to introduce uh, our, our speakers, the first talk will be by Nicola Go. Uh, she is uh, the, the communication manager uh, from uh, the International Dairy Federation, and she is also um, responsible for communication from, um, for the design project. The, the next speaker you probably know is um, Professor John Huxley uh, from, from Massey University. He is the head of the veterinary school um, uh, there. He moved uh, two years ago to New Zealand. He is originally um, from, from the UK. And, um, 
a, a very well-known uh, researcher and, and, and having also um, uh, uh, yeah, managing the link from, from uh, research, but also the, the being excellent uh, researcher, but bringing also high, high impact uh, solutions for uh, down to the farm. And, uh, and our next, and then our next speaker is Anne-Marie Christen from, from Lactanet. She's project manager there and has for several years worked on different projects on, on Chlorhauf. And Anne-Marie is working together with us um, for our working group on, on Chlorhauf since uh, several years. And she was actually the one coordinating the work on uh, harmonization of um, of the lameness, uh, lameness recording, and uh, and uh, we're looking forward to her, for her presentation. And uh, last but not least, uh, our uh, next uh, last speaker is uh, Dr. Nick Bell from from the UK. He is um, a honorary associate professor at the Nottingham University and director of the Heart Health and Welfare Consultancy organization and he is uh, also a member of various committees and Nick was also involved in, um, in, in our expert group or we are working together uh, in ICA on this uh, low health guidelines and also on this uh, lameness guidelines and I think um, we are I'm looking forward for all those uh, presentations and I think they will, will be very interesting. Um, just a few organizational aspects. Um, we have, uh, um, when you ask questions, please use questions and answers, not the chat. Uh, we will, after each talk, uh, we, we, we might have one to two questions, and then uh, we will have more the, the common discussion uh, later. And, um, and uh, the next thing is that we would like um, to get an overview uh, who is or an ideal actually who is participating and um, Cesare will uh, launch uh, three uh, questions here and um, when they pop up at your screen then uh, please uh, fill it out and then uh, about a minute later we will look at the at the results um, Cesare, please, could you show the, the survey? So we have here three questions, actually four, and here you can scroll down. Please uh, fill out which group of stakeholders do you represent. We would like to see a bit an overview um, who is uh, participating tonight. And um, and then there, the next question is whether you use lameness scoring scheme uh, by yourself? And if yes, for which purpose you use it? And then the last question is, do you think that harmonization of lameness scoring is important and beneficial? Don't know whether you need more time or you could answer already. I think Cesare, are you? Uh, they are still, still voting, Tristan. Uh, okay. Okay, maybe the first uh, oh, 170. On top of the screen, you can see how people voted, uh, Krista. Uh, 190 out of 333. Okay, yeah, but I think points. we, yeah, I think we continue the question. Yeah, okay. maybe now, maybe now. Okay, not yet. Okay, I'm going to close uh, the polling. Okay. Um, okay. Just a few seconds. Okay, three, two, one. I close. 
Okay. And I'm going to share the the results, Krista. Okay. So if you that you can see it, you have to you have to to click on polls, then you can see the results. Can everyone see the results? Okay. So we see we have a um, yeah a quite good distribution or so different groups actually there there was in the chat that we uh, did not uh, indicate animal welfare um, specialists so that we missed this group and i think we need to to, um, to write down that next time we have also this group The seven. Okay. Um, then do you use lameness scoring schemes? So three thirds of the participants are using it or those who um, attend, um, participated in the survey. Um, so it's uh, herd management and, and welfare assessment, a bit more welfare assessment. And um, yeah, an overwhelming, <laughs> um, confirmation that harmonization is important. So actually, this is a confirmation uh, confirmation of the work and intention of, um, of the cooperation work we are doing. Okay, so then I think we can um, continue to um, our first talk and I would like to give the floor to, to Nicola, please. Nicola, can you share your screen? You are, um, you are still, uh, we cannot hear you. You are muted. You are muted. Not a good start, okay. is it? <laughs> yeah, okay. And please share your screen. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so hi everyone, um, and on behalf of the International Dairy Federation, thank you for joining this joint webinar with ICAR today. Um, before we start the presentations, I'll just take five minutes of your time just to introduce the DISARM project of which um, IDF um, is a partner. So for those of you who aren't familiar with DISARM, um, it's a thematic network under the Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme of the EU. It's a collaboration between farmers, veterinarians, advisory services, academics and industry, which focuses on sharing innovative solutions in the livestock industry to reduce antibiotic use and consequently reduce and prevent um, antimicrobial resistance. So the project aims to deliver on a number of aspects. So it's the aim is really to bring everyone together to promote best practices in livestock farming, um, which can reduce the need for antibiotic use by focusing on things like biosecurity, um, breeding for resilience and animal health, alternative treatment options, and targeted use of antibiotics. Um, the project aims to share information across farming sectors, species and countries. This includes um, events and workshops to raise awareness, to connect livestock farmers, um, farm advisors and the veterinary community with um, those who've adopted um, innovative strategies um, to reducing um, antibiotic resistance. The project also aims to um, provide information and resources on best practice, uh, management strategies and new technologies um, to ultimately um, reduce antibiotic resistance. And this includes the development of ethical farm health plans based on input from farmers, um, advisors and veterinarians um, involved at the farm level. The project um, also brings together um, further research and innovation work on reducing antibiotic resistance on farms and um, promotional work as well through the development of platforms, programs and um, events, both unique um, disarm events and also opportunities like this to try and share it to the, the, wider, um, the wider community. So as you can see um, from on screen, just to give a bit of information about the 
how the project is organized. Um, so it's led by a number of livestock organizations across Europe, um, IDF being one. Um, this partnership allows for the development of a community of people with an interest in reducing um, antibiotic resistance in livestock farming. Um, the way that it works is members share um, ideas, innovative solutions, um, review practices and problems, and learn from the experiences and knowledge of others. Um, the resources that there is an I, there is a disarm website as well, and the resources are available in a range of languages to try and maximize um, maximize sharing. And there's also um, a newsletter that's published in, in multiple languages as well. So the aim of, of the presentation today is really to try and get people involved in the project. So there's a number of ways to get involved in the in disarm. You can join the Disarm Community of Practice on Facebook uh, to discuss and exchange ideas. Um, it's really, it's very interactive. Um, we want people to get involved, to develop, to share effective practical solutions to combat um, anti-antibody resistance. You can also register on the website to receive Disarm's latest news and attend um, or participate in upcoming events and workshops to learn from those who already successfully reduced antibiotic usage. You can um, access information on strategies to, um, strategies to reduce antibiotic resistance on, um, on the resource pages on the website. There's, the resource pages are um, very well populated. Um, new information is being added all the time. So I really would recommend um, taking a look on there um, on a regular basis. And we, we would like to ask if, if you are a farmer who'd like to be involved in the development of a farm health plan or to host an event or workshop, please do get in touch um, via the Disarm website or, or by contacting me. Um, we appreciate that times are quite difficult right now, um, but we're more than happy to try and help set up virtual events if that's at all possible. And that's it really. So to close, there is a wealth of information on the Disarm Project website. We invite you to take a look. Um, it's the, the web address that's on screen at the moment. It's, um, the project's also on social media. So we encourage you to, to follow and to share um, with anyone who might find these resources useful. Um, so that's a very short start, five minutes, I think, Krista. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> okay. Nicola, thank you very much for pres uh, presenting this arm. I think it's very important to cooperate with projects who have a very strong focus on dissemination and also putting um, best practices um, into practice. And I think, um, therefore, it's, uh, it's really good um, to have, have this presentation. There is uh, one, is there a question? Not really, I don't know. Okay, if there is uh, no question, I think, then um, I say thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for your presentation and also to, to, to IDF for, for cooperation, to Maria and, 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 and the whole team. Um, I think it's, uh, it's really good to work together on uh, such important uh, topics. Okay, then, um, then I would like uh, to ask John to, to give uh, his talk about um, um, lameness, a uh, global dairy uh, challenge. Um, John, uh, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Tao. Uh, welcome from a rather stormy New Zealand morning. I apologise if you hear the rain behind me, but it has just started absolutely hurling it down, as it tends to do in New Zealand. Um, so welcome, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organisers, ICA IDF, for the invitation to speak to you this morning, uh, this evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I guess I've just looked through the, the participants list, and I am going to feel a bit of a fraud speaking to, to, to such a uh, an expert audience, but I hope you'll forgive me. I, I've been given the brief just to really uh, review where we are with, with lameness and just touch on some of the challenges that we face at a global level. And I guess the first thing I would like to, to remind us all is this is a global problem. Um, it doesn't matter what system, what scale, what size, where you are in the world, lameness is reported as a problem. So uh, the intensive systems, the extensive systems, the large herds, the small herds, we all are reporting lameness as a problem. 
And if we look at the sorts of levels we're talking about, they're, they're reasonably significant. I'm going to focus on prevalence um, today because uh, that's the, 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 the metric and the method that, that we're talking about measuring lameness, and it's certainly the one that everybody has adopted. And if we look at average herd level prevalences, the last sort of 10, 15 years of, of research from around the world would suggest these sorts of levels. So the more extensive systems will report herd level prevalences of between five and 15%, that sort of level. And the more intensive systems will report uh, herd level prevalences of, of 15 to 30% as an average herd level. And of course, I'm sure Nick will mention it later on. One of the one of the great learnings we've had is that the variation between farms is huge. So in all the systems, the variation tends to range from close to zero to actually in some of the, particularly some of the more intensive systems, very often uh, above 60, 70 percent on some herds, giving us those sorts of sorts of averages. The other thing we know is that uh, lameness is under-identified. Um, farmers and uh, and for a long time many researchers and I would include myself in that we were under identifying the, the the levels of lameness we had on farm and I think it's important to remember that that if we go back to the variation between the systems uh, the extensive systems and of course uh, in New Zealand and, and my local experience is, is one of those would very often feel that this isn't their problem but I think we need to accept that if you try and convince a consumer that one in 10 or even one in 20 cows is lame, that still isn't acceptable. So we need to accept this absolutely is a global problem. And it has some profound impacts. Um, if you look at the sorts of uh, the impacts that we're seeing from lameness around the world, and again, this is now based on probably nearly 20 years of, of, of research that has started looking at this. It appears that lameness will cost us about 350 litres um, per, per case uh, in, in terms of milk yield. Uh, and there's a number of factors which will lead to greater losses. So when the case occurs, so earlier in lactation will lead to greater losses. So a case of lameness earlier in lactation leads to greater losses. Severity, a more severe case will increase loss. And duration, uh, again, uh, the longer a, a, an animal is lame, the more milk um, she will lose. And I, I don't think if you think about it, any of those sh things should surprise us very much. So it is impacting on yield. But again, I, I think it's always important we remember this. Um, this, this graph has sort of been re, uh, reproduced in a number of pieces of research from around the world. This is our representation of it, uh, simply because I've got the data. This is um, two lactation curves reproduced from an entire lactation of cows, a thousand, more than a thousand cows, uh, lender scored every two weeks. And the two lactation curves represent cows which were never lame um, during that uh, lactation versus the cows which were ever lame, so ever had a, lame, a, a score lame during lactation. And what we see is that lameness is a disease of higher producing cows. So the ever lame cows, cows which had a case of lameness, had a high, were higher producing. And so it's important we remember this because we talk about uh, lameness leading to lost milk production, but very often we don't see it. These cows start as the higher yielding cows in a herd. And so they're not identified on farm as low yielding cows, even though they have definitely lost milk. <clears throat> and then if we come to fertility, fertility of all the areas is probably the area that's been best, um, the best investigated. It really impacts, lameness impacts on virtually every metric and um, every aspect of fertility that we can measure as researchers. And I've provided a list of all the areas that it's been demonstrated to impact just on the slide there. So that we know that lameness causes <clears throat> fertility problems. And again, on average, it, it appears to be at a global level, the sort of 10, 20, 30, even perhaps 40 days extension to the to the calving interval on average, 10, 20, 30 days. So it really is impacting on fertility. <clears throat> and we know it also increases the risk of culling. Although this is the area that I think probably we, we most underestimate, not because, uh, not because it's not a real effect, but simply because if we look at the data that's recorded on farm, lameness very often isn't recorded as the reason for culling. 
it's the yield or actually usually the fertility which is recorded as the as the reason for culling and so we probably underestimate the impact of, of lameness on culling because it's uh, one of the fundamentals which is underpinning the the loss of yield and the low fertility which is then leading to the culling so those are the production losses and if we move on to what we know and what we think we know about how it impacts cows from a from a well-being perspective uh, there's now a wealth of, of data from all over the world uh, asking vets, producers and advisors and students and everybody else what level of their discomfort they think that, that, that cows are suffering with, with lameness. And we most of the work has used this standard 10 point scale where one is no pain at all and 10 is the worst pain imaginable. And most of the data would put lameness and the causes of lameness in this sort of uh, this sort of range, the five, six, seven, eight on that ten point scale. So this is significant discomfort. If you think about the sorts of things that you would grade on a, on your own pain scale at the sort of five, six, seven, and certainly eight level, these are getting painful events, and that's what we judge uh, lameness and some of the common causes of lameness. Uh, to, to cause the animals that we look after. So if we, if we sum all that up, the impacts are profound. So I, again, I'm not going to go into the exact details of, of, of how much loss we are seeing when we try and calculate this, but this is many hundreds of dollars, euros, pounds, whatever your currency is. Um, all of the data suggests this is hundreds of, of uh, or significant losses if you add up the culling yield fertility uh, and other problems that are associated with lameness. This is having big effects on the global dairy herd. And lastly, and I think the one that's really come through and come through to the fore, certainly over the last 10 plus years, is when we put all that together, we need to accept this has a rep this is a reputational challenge for the industry because uh, first of all rightly so this is a this is a, a disease affecting a lot of animals and, and causing discomfort and of course the other challenge we have here is this is a disease that the public understand you don't need to be an expert to understand lameness and to identify lameness uh, in, in animals you know if we look at some of our other big challenges uh, perhaps let's pick mastitis in, as an example. I think the average member of the, uh, of the public would find mastitis much more challenging to understand and identify, whereas lameness is front and centre uh, and, and um, the public understand it. And, and certainly we are seeing this coming to the fore as a, as a challenge reputationally for the whole industry. And I think when I got into lameness, I think the thing that, that struck me uh, was how far behind our understanding of lameness was compared to some of the other big endemic diseases. So again, if we ask, uh, if we ask producers around the world, they would tend to record mastitis, infertility and lameness as their big three problems. There are, there are other, depending on where you are in the world, there are others that make that top three. But those are the big three endemic diseases, mastitis, infertility and lameness. Uh, and if we compare our understanding um, of, of disease control on farm and actually uh, the, un the, the underlying causes, um, we're a long way behind with lameness compared with these other two diseases. And we could judge that by any metric in terms of the amount of research publications, the amount of research dollars, uh, the control mechanisms on farm. We've always lagged behind with lameness. And we could talk about why that is. But actually, I think for me, one of the, the profound reasons is when we look at close to cow research, um, there hasn't been great pharmaceutical company interest in lameness because compared with infertility and, and mastitis, uh, the pharmaceutical companies who, who clearly uh, underpin a lot of the research that takes place in these areas uh, haven't had a, a mechanism to, to derive huge benefit. And so if we sum that up, I think in terms of the number of, numbers of animals affected, we know it's large numbers. The, de the degree of discomfort this disease is causing, the length of time that, that uh, lameness will last for in cows, we know this is a chronic disease. If we add all those th things together, we know we've got a, a big global problem in terms of an endemic disease. And then I think we, we should add one of the, one of two of the, the newer understandings that we have about lameness uh, to, to add to why perhaps lameness has come to the fore um, over the last few years. Firstly, we now understand that, that for many of the causes of lameness, 
it's a vicious downward spiral. So disease begets disease. When an animal becomes lame for the first time, she's more likely to become lame again in the future. Um, a little bit like our understanding of, of Staph aureus uh, mastitis, uh, for example. We know that once a, an animal is, uh, has a case of Staph aureus mastitis, that makes her far more likely to have a case again in the future. And all of the latest research is demonstrating that is true of lameness. We've also seen work demonstrating that lameness probably upregulates the pain pathways. And of course, that's really important to us to remember. So an animal which becomes lame upregulates pain pathways, making her more likely to show lameness and to feel lameness more profoundly when she has the next case. And we've seen the impacts on, on industry reputation coming through and this being identified as something that our consumer really does care about. And so I think that explains why, actually, if we look at what's happened over the last decade or more, we have suddenly seen some, some very significant advances. And we've seen uh, uh, much more investment in our understanding and, con and control of this disease on farm. And, and you know, uh, rightly so. I think it's great that that sea change has occurred. And it has been a sea change. If you look at where lameness research was and lameness funding, lameness control on farm, sort of 15 plus years ago, the last 10 to 15 years have seen a profound change. And, you know, I can only speak from my own, uh, my own example. I've been extremely fortunate to now have um, a full decade of consistent funding of research into lameness. And I think that just identifies uh, the importance that, that the producers and other organizations are, are focusing on lameness. And I know looking at who's in the room with us, uh, I know some, some of you have also been the recipients of, of that sea change in, in, our, in the funding and control of lameness. I just wanted to very quickly, as I draw to an end, so sort of identify for, for me what um, has been our big changes in understanding of control over the last decade or so. And I just wanted to highlight four or five things very quickly. I don't intend to dwell on them uh, to any great extent. But I think um, the, the things that really have come through for me are, are these, first of all, early identification, prompt effective treatment. Work from all over the world has been demonstrated. If we identify lameness early, treat it quickly and effectively, it decreases and profoundly decreases the impact this uh, uh, the disease has on animals. And again, every time I say this, I, I sort of, it, we shouldn't have to say this, you know, as a veterinarian, I say this and think, you know, is it any surprise to us that uh, it's better to treat disease early and when it's mild rather than leave it to become chronic and severe? And, but the research has, has clearly demonstrated that there's a real benefit in early identification, prompt effective treatment. I think um, the second thing I would highlight is our understanding of the vicious downward spiral. I've mentioned it already, but I, I think it's important we highlight it again. <clears throat> All of the, the research that's coming out now is demonstrating that once an animal becomes lame, she is far more likely to have lameness again in the future. And that's really important for, for our understanding of control on farm, because it means that if we can intervene early and prevent first cases occurring, we can actually impact on the whole lifetime of that animal. Um, and so the, the vicious downward spiral of disease is important, an important aspect for us to consider. Then I guess I, we, we get into perhaps some of the more um, uh, controversial areas, but um, anybody who's heard me speak before will know that I'm, I'm certainly an advocate uh, in this area. If we look at the etiopathogenesis, the causes of particularly claw horn disease, not so much dermatitis in this regard, I think historically we'd, we would have thought about this as predominantly a metabolic disease with some mechanical components, but all of the research now is suggesting this is predominantly a mechanical disease uh, with some metabolic components. We're seeing this shift in our understanding. So we're moving away from the idea that this is ruminacidosis and laminitis, much more to this being an environmental, the impact of the environment and changes to the structures in the hoof. And our, our focus has been on these areas. We focus much more on the calving effect. We know that, that calving has a profound impact, impact on the whole body, including the foot. Uh, and actually it appears that it's calving that's initiating some of the challenges that underpin claw horn disease. We've seen a lot of focus on the digital cushion and the role of the digital cushion and, and how body condition score loss impacts on the digital cushion. Uh, and more recently, we're seeing increasingly 
that lameness, our understanding of why um, a case of lameness leads to a future case of lameness, it's because it alters those structures in the foot. So it alters the digital cushion and we see new bone forming on P3, both of those things leading to the next case of lameness, this downward spiral of disease. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight the role of non -steroidals. Again, looking at who's in the room, I know there's a number of us who've been working on non um, over the last decade or more and, and, and trying to understand the role of non in lameness control, but I wanted to very briefly um, highlight what I think is the best study that I've ever designed and, uh, and, and completed. We have just completed a, a three year long treat, randomized treatment intervention study um, using non -steroidals. And non steroidals as the previous work have demonstrated, are having profound effects. So instead of one off treatments with non steroidals, in this study, what we did was we random alloc randomly allocated cows for life to a treatment group where they either received non steroidal or didn't receive non steroidal associated with lameness events over that three year period. So an animal could carve in and then get non steroidal at every, uh, every time she was identified identified lame and treated and we are seeing profound effects and I'm afraid it's too early well we're preparing that for submission right now uh, and I can't go into a lot more detail as I'm sure you'll appreciate but we it really appears that non uh, can have profound effects as an intervention on farm if they're used uh, at all cases and so as I wrap up um, I guess one of the big uh, one of the big, my big understandings of, of my more than a decade of, 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 of lameness research has been that one of the things that we have lacked is consistently recorded high quality data. Uh, I came from, uh, uh, I started my career as a mastitis researcher. I see my former supervisor is in the audience. Hi, Andrew. Uh, and coming from a background of, of mastitis research where we have huge quantities of good quality data one of the, the things I learned from lameness was that really wasn't the case. And for those of us working on lameness, one of the first big problems we've always had is recording that high quality data. And we've had to go out and do that ourselves. And that's added huge amounts of, of cost uh, to, the, to the research that we've, we've been conducting. And so I'm delighted when I see initiatives like the ICAR IDF initiative that we're here to talk about tonight, because we're starting to see that um, uh, consolidation and, uh, and, and mechanisms for consistently recording the high quality data we need. And we know it makes a difference. We know that high quality uh, farm level data, uh, lameness data, leads to early identification and prompt effective treatment. Uh, we know that once we start measuring this, it starts getting identified and treated. We also know it drives on farm action. There's a number of really nice studies which have demonstrated if all, if all we do is implement routine monitoring and recording on farm, and if farms adopt that, suddenly it moves up their priority list for, for making change. Uh, and there's a number of studies which have demonstrate that, demonstrated that good quality data drives on farm action. It certainly drives our disease understanding. Um, as I've talked about, one of the, the big problems we all had when we first started investigating this disease was that we didn't have the high quality data even as a, as a benchmark. Uh, and it was uh, some of the Scandinavian countries that really showed us the way in that regard um, and, the, and the types of epidemiological data that we could get out of having consistently recorded uh, high quality data um, at a national level. So uh, thank you for, for, for Scandinavia for, for really driving us in that regard. And lastly, of course, genetic selection. If you talk to the, the geneticist, um, one of the big problems they, they always point at lameness is they, they say, well, give us the high quality phenotypic data on farm, and we know that we can start selecting uh, for, for lines of cows which are, are, are less, uh, are more resistant to disease, because if we know that we can select, it is heritable and we can select for some aspects. So as I say, I'm absolutely delighted to see the initiative launched, launched by ICAR IDF. I think it's, it's, it's long overdue, uh, and I'm sure it will become the next um, uh, fundamental underpinning step in progressing our understanding of disease over the next decade or more. Thank you very much for your time and uh, I will hand back to our organiser. Thank you. Okay, John, thank you very much for the, for the really interesting and motivating talk and also for, let's say, uh, yeah, encouraging us in our work to see that, um, that research really see, uh, 
shows that there is that there is benefit and that there is important that we work on this uh, harmonization. Uh, before moving uh, to the next to the next talk, um, I think uh, we could have one uh, one or two uh, question questions. There there is one on how lameness affects ovarian cyclicity. Any mechanism? Possibly there is another question related to the fertility, the link between lameness and fertility yeah. made yeah. by Sofia Matalia. So there yeah, are two I, questions that are very similar, possibly. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, no, I, I, I see them both. And, uh, and I think, you know, I didn't dwell on it and I certainly didn't uh, take the, the time because of, of time, constraints, time constraints today. But this is an area that we find really challenging because we end up with this circular argument of high yield, fertility, lameness, loss of body condition, poor nutrition, and actually working out what is starting, what it's chicken and egg, you know, where does this start? Is it the lameness that impacts on nutrition, which impacts on fertility, or is it the genetic lines of these cows, which mean that they are infertile, become lame, but are high yielding? Yeah, it's, it's a hugely challenging area. And Honestly, I think um, we're going to struggle, really struggle to pick this out. But it does, uh, it does um, get me onto one of my uh, one of my um, favourite areas, which actually I start wondering whether there is a unifying theory here, because if you look at some of the latest data uh, where we start looking at um, a transition, it, I wonder whether there is an, a, an under, a unifying theory somewhere where because we know we can identify animals even in transition, which will fail in early lactation. And, and I just wonder whether there is something pulling all, all, all those three things together. If we get into the specifics of, of impact on, on ovarian function, again, there, there is some work and I, I haven't got it. It's not my real um, area of strength, but we've certainly demonstrated that, that lameness is associated with changes to ovarian function. But you are right, the problem is, is that because these are high yielding cows and that's where why they're having uh, fertility problems and then they subsequently become lame. It, it's a hugely challenging area. It's a, that's a very long-winded way of not really answering, sorry. Okay, John, thank you very much. Uh, we have um, quite some other very interesting questions, but I think we will keep them then for our general discussion. And I, uh, I, um, John, thank you very much. And uh, we will move to Anne-Marie Christen from, from Lactanet. And um, she will uh, present um, the work we did together with uh, the different experts uh, on Glow Health on recording um, lameness in, in dairy or on guidelines for recording lameness in dairy cattle. And we are then uh, really interested also to get the uh, feedback to that. Anne-Marie, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Krista. You hear me well? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everybody. So uh, Dr. Oxley just presented an excellent presentation on the impact of lameness for the dairy industry, uh, but has his, his stress already in this presentation. If we want to improve the situation, we need to record numbers and information. So today I'm very pleased to be the representative of that group of experts who uh, get together and decide to create these ICAR guidelines for recording lameness in dairy cattle. So the objective of my presentation today is to give you a quick overview of the content of these guidelines. I invite you all to download those guidelines because there is in uh, very interesting information, references, tables that will help you to start recording lameness uh, on the farm and maybe for your industry. These uh, guidelines can be found on the ICAR website under the heading guidelines, the section seven and extract number five. The aim of these guidelines is to harmonize the trait definition and to standardize the data recording process. Uh, the guideline describes the common lameness scoring methods that are used in the world. And we have more specifically um, the recommended practices for an harmonized scheme. These recommendations can be used for different objectives. 
um, such as the herd claw health management, animal welfare assessment, benchmarking, or genetic evaluation, as Dr. Asley just mentioned. Now let's see together the main recommended practices for scoring lameness. The system that is proposed by ICAR is a five-point scale system, including information on the posture, the gait, and some behavioral criteria. How do we record lameness? It's on a flat, firm, and non-slippery surface, a surface that the cow are familiar to. The assessor should see the side view of the cows for a better evaluation of the posture and the gates. Uh, the guidelines for the one that are interested also propose some uh, specific step-by-step -step methods for recording lameness in freestall barns and as well as tire stall barns because the way that we record the information is different. Uh, when do we record lameness? Ideally, is right after milking, as it is more convenient with normal farm work, and it should be done on a very calm environment. The gait of the cow is generally improved after milking because the reduced size of the other and the motivation of the cows to going back in the, uh, to their pen. Uh, how many animals should we assess? It's usually proportional to pen size or herd size. So in the guidelines, you will, you will find information about how, how many numbers of cows, depending on the size of the herd. The guidelines also proposes information for large pasture-based herds, like that is existing in the country of Dr. Osley in New Zealand and as well in, the, in Australia. How often should we look for lameness? every two weeks to once a month, according to the farm objective. Every two weeks would be optimal because uh, it's, it's very important for early detecting of the new cases. But sometime on farm condition, human resources and the time that is required to record lameness can reduce the, this frequency. The user, the guidelines that we are proposing are very simple. So they can be used easily by dairy farmers, veterinarian, hoof trimmer, dairy advisor, as well as firm employee. But the most important factor is the training. Literature reports that training should be a combination of a theoretical instruction and practical training. Uh, they recommended that the annual training uh, is highly recommended because the more you score cows, uh, the better you are at seeing the lame cows. It's a bit similar to body condition scoring. Without training, as people tend to get used to see lame cows in their environment, only the severely lame cow can be detected. Now I'm going to present you the, uh, the table that summarizes all the criteria for each cow. So this table will describe the five different score of lameness. For each uh, score, there are two pictures, one showing a standing cow and the other a walking cow. And for each score, uh, there is a description about the posture and the gait of the cow. And on the last column, uh, some more criteria which can help to differentiate between two scores, like the movement of the head, if the joint are stiff, and the reluctance of bearing weights. Sometimes this information can be useful to differentiate which scar you are, you are looking at. Here is the, the information for score one, two, and three, and then the guidelines you will also find the information for score four and five. This proposal is not new information, but a combination of existing information. First, the pressure system, one to five, that is widely used and easily applied under farm condition. Uh, then the picture from Zimpro that show uh, the reluctance of bearing weight on the affected limb. The picture also put an emphasis on the back line of the cow, which can help to detect problems. 
and the written description and criteria are from the code of practices for the care and handling of dairy cattle that is used in Canada. Now that we have a system in place, how can we use the lameness data? For certainly for herd management, it helped dairy farmers and the advisor to early detect the claw problems. Early detection will prevent the escalation of repeated events and will surely avoid chronic cases. But if we want to improve and monitor the lameness at the herd level, the information should be recorded in the herd management software of the farm, or at least on a paper recording sheet for future consideration. Another way that we are now seeing more and more on farm is mobile application for recording lameness, which can be fast and very useful. If the information is stored in a central data bank, then we have more possibilities to widely use the information and the data. We can think of benchmarking for improving the, the health of the herd. As a, a, and also like the welfare, this disease, it's a visible disease. So it's very important on a consumer uh, point of view because they are very concerned the way we are uh, the, the way we are doing uh, milk production. So they have an eye on, on this. So this is why uh, lameness scoring is commonly used in welfare assessment. Uh, lameness information can also be used for improving the health of the herd through genetic selection. Feet and leg condition can be improved by breedings and there is a correlation between lameness and claw health traits. So genetics, is one of the tools that the farmers can use to improve the feet and leg condition and lameness in their herd. So that was quickly the information that you will find in the document. The, it also contains more detailed information like the risk factor, useful reference about the practices just presented, example of other system used for scoring lameness like the mobility scoring, and more detailed information about the use of this inform the, the data. So I take this opportunity to thank the experts who work on the guidelines and for their excellent cooperation. This group also produced in 2015 the Claw Health Atlas that can be found also on the ICAR website under the publication heading. And just for your information, this atlas has been already translated into 21 different languages. Thank you for your attention. Anne-Marie, thank you very much for, for your interesting presentation and especially also for, for all your work you, you put into uh, this joint work with us. And I also want to thank all the experts who have um, contributed and committed uh, to this work. Um, we are a little bit over time. There is, I've seen there is um, one question, but which probably needs a bit more, more time to answer. And I guess this is something because there is a, a question concerning the recording scheme of, of Becker. I've, I have the feeling that we should keep it for the discussion afterwards when we discuss on this. Um, well, Cesare, do you see a very fast question uh, to answer? No, 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 but we will do our best to put a, a document on the website together with the video and the presentations. This, video, this document will contain the questions and the answer that the uh, panelists are going to provide after the meeting. So yeah. please, as soon as you receive this, uh, my email, regarding the availability of videos and PowerPoint, that page will contain also, most, also these uh, documents. Yeah, the okay. okay. Because it's difficult to concentrate uh, uh, different questions into single one. And okay. we can probably send along the link to get the document. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. So if you, Anna, if you don't mind, then we keep this uh, question, um, this, uh, for the discussion afterwards there on, on this relation with high production lameness um, that um, 
um, that this that this is caused more by mechanical disorders than by met metabolic disorders. But we keep this maybe late. maybe just one uh, information for Mr. João Canas da Silva. Um, the ICAR, ICAR suggests you to browse the ICAR guidelines uh, uh, that are freely available on the ICAR website, icar.org. So uh, you can browse that and get uh, the link uh, to the document for the classification of laminus. Okay, thank you, Cesare. Then, uh, Nick, please, if we uh, can ask you for your presentation. Can you see that okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, you. well, uh, thank you. Hello to everyone uh, who's on the line tonight, and uh, a big thank you to ICAR and IDF for the invitation to speak on this subject. It's become the major theme of my, my veterinary career, thanks uh, to a, a very special opportunity I had 18 years ago to um, embark on a PhD at Bristol University with some very, uh, uh, very good colleagues. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the work and experience I've had with using mobility scoring or lameness scoring, as we're going to be referring to it tonight, um, in the field. And I'm going to really major on the, the topic of trying to improve consistency and um, and John's already touched on that topic, uh, trying to understand what, what we mean by accuracy. And I'm going to say, explain why I think we need to move away from being very focused on some of the traditional lesions causing lameness that are probably more end stage type lesions. Uh, and as a in the process of doing all of that, how we manage everyone's expectations so that we are not dealing with end stage disease, but dealing with the early onset of, of lameness. So um, ju just as a sort of an overview of the, the topics I, I want to cover in the next 20 minutes, uh, lameness scoring makes an extremely valuable metric. We deal with numbers, measures of Foot tell of, 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 of mastitis, of fertility, of general herd health. And uh, if we want to manage a condition such as lameness, then we really do need to have some robust metrics in order to establish the where we are currently when we're working with a farm and, um, and where we want to be. I also want to talk about the fact that Lameness scoring, while you, you can teach yourself to some degree that if you want to have standardization, that means you've got a comparable metric between farms and over time, then you need to do some degree of standardization. And that can't be a self-taught exercise. So you have to do some form of training in order to make sure that you as, a, as an observer don't uh, uh, inadvertently drift in the way that you're scoring and that what you are measuring is comparable to others. And as I mentioned uh, just now that most classic lesions, in, in, in my opinion and the opinion of quite a number of others now working in this field, are advanced end stage type of disease and uh, we really need to try and tackle that. And as I say, we, we, we need to manage these expectations carefully. So that's a, a, a brief overview of what I want to talk about. So um, J John mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that we, we do see this discrepancy between what the farmer perceives as lame and, and what the independent observer, particularly the researcher, and I've worked as a researcher in this field now for 18 years, and, and we, we see this consistently, and hopefully less than we used to, but it, it is still a major challenge for us working with farmers anywhere in the world. And that's not meant to mean as a, a, a criticism of farmers. So here we've got a scatter graph showing on the, the y-axis, the prevalence of cattle in, in herds uh, as measured uh, by researchers and along the x-axis, the prevalence as reported by the farmer or estimated by the farmer in most instances. And what you see is that actually the, the perfect correlation would be along the blue dotted line uh, and quite clearly what, what we see here is most of the farmer estimates are somewhere between 0 and 10%, whereas the researcher estimates are ranging from 
eighty percent down down to to close to zero. So, um, so major discrepancies there between researchers and the farmer. Now, you could uh, quite rightly get into a debate about who is right in these instances, and of course, what we're talking about is an an assessment of of lameness levels and we've really highlighted that the term lameness can mean such a different thing to different people so there is a real advantage to placing a score to demonstrate that we're dealing with a spectrum and to place the cow in the correct spot along her spectrum of lameness behavior so uh, my interest in this subject was really stimulated as part of my phd study and um, I, I was visiting 60 farms and um, evaluating lameness in great detail on those 50 farms. And uh, one of the, the key conclusions of that work, one of the biggest predictors of the prevalence of severe lameness was how well the farm implemented early detection, prompt effective treatment. Now, that, that, there, there was an intervention component part of this study, but this was probably the most important finding from from my perspective as a, a lameness researcher, and, and then, as I say, became a, a bit of a major theme for us uh, working on the, the subject of lameness in the UK. We, we built on that with initially a case study where we looked at, uh, and here we've got a graph from that case study where we thought, well, let's apply the concepts of early detection, prompt effective treatment, or ed pet as we would abbreviate it to, to a farm, a high prevalence farm, 70% of cows lame, and we using those principles we could take that farm from 70 percent lameness levels uh, ter terribly high that down to 15 or 16 percent over the course of just over a year which was a, our probably our, our initial bit of confirmation that this was probably a good theme to work on we followed that up with a randomized control trial where we allocated cows to a treatment and control group and again demonstrated we were able to reduce the prevalence of lameness um, significantly in that way, but we also demonstrated that chronic lameness is a, a real issue and that in, in most commercial dairy herds there is a delay to treatment uh, which might be for practical reasons, it might be for awareness reasons. And then John mentioned the, the work that was then followed up with a couple of ra uh, randomised control trial, uh, trials at Nottingham University that really helped us understand more about the effective treatment element of that equation. So to summarize, there is a growing body of evidence to show the importance of early detection prompt effective treatment to the overall management and reduction of lameness in dairy herds. Of course, there, there is no room for guesswork in the dairy industry. And, and I really believe that passionately as, a, as an advisor, as someone working as an advisor in the field, uh, and particularly as a researcher, we, we need to have some robust measures and we can use those ro robust measures for benchmarking purposes and we could use prevalence uh, and we can also benchmark severity and in those instances perhaps every three to 12 months it is a, a useful interval for for assessing lameness but if we want to use um, uh, get a better understanding of trends at a farm level then perhaps more in the way of monthly uh, monitoring of lameness is using mobility scores is more useful but if we really want to use lameness scoring as a screening tool then we really need to be looking at every one to two week intervals in our scoring and and this is when actually the the use of scoring systems can become hugely powerful because it does have enormous potential and utility as a screening tool particularly in the large herds where there may be uh, people who are less tuned to lameness uh, working with cows in the parlour. So in, in those instances, having someone dedicated to screening cows can be uh, very useful and, and powerful. And then, of course, we through this process, we then generate some useful data that we can then start to tease out things like um, cure rates, which might be four to six, well, we would say five week cure rates, can then generate uh, some useful additional information to, to hone some of the treatment protocols that we might be applying on dairy farms. So all of this data ca can be enormously useful. And, and here's a, uh, a farm, some data from a farm that I work with. It's a uh, thousand cows. And we, we would 
do a formal lameness score every month. And then as a weekly exercise, someone that the herd manager would uh, watch every cow from every group uh, as a screening exercise. So that we get the combination of data that we can use at the, the herd level on a monthly basis and some screening data that we, we've got from the, the cows at individual cow level on a weekly basis. And we can use this data and analyze it in a whole host of ways using uh, software that we've got available in order to categorize cows as in a ver various different ways as chronic new cases, recovered cases, uh, or remaining sound. And uh, I think this is a, an area of, of growing uh, interest and development and, um, and, and as th software develops in the future, we'll see um, better insights being gained from the use of this type of data. But all of this really does hinge on having good quality, robust data. And we, we can really work on the consistency of this. But I, I just want to pose the question now, uh, is this cow lame? I'm going to show you a video and I would just like you as the audience to have a look and make a decision. So I'm only going to show her to you once. And now, uh, Cesare, if you uh, are able to open the polling and just ask people if they would like to vote, do you think she is lame? Yes or no? And I'd just like to see what your thoughts are. I've shown her briefly once and um, hopefully that was enough of a glimpse if you're scoring a thousand cows, and I would score about, uh, personally, I'd score about 20,000 cows a year, and I would analyze the data from about 100,000 cows. And, and, and in my efforts at scoring some of the large herds, that's probably about as much time as you're gonna get to evaluate a cow. So you, you do have to get confident at uh, seeing these cows. So uh, Cesare, if we're able to close the voting and see what, what people, thought of that cow. So, um, okay, and, and that is absolutely what I was expecting, that we were going to get some split opinion there as to whether she was lame or not. So this is where I think the, the concept of scoring training and standardization really uh, need careful consideration. So uh, let me, hopefully this is going to, and, and standardization, I, I warn people that to any sort of lameness scoring observation of cow behaviors have a high degree of subjectivity but so does perception of color and we we would mostly agree that the, the, the circle on the left is blue and the circle on the right is red there may be some differences in our color perception but generally with a little bit of training as a child we quickly learn our colors and in the same way we learn to recognize cow behaviors and what, what's really important to recognize is there are a number of different behaviors, back arch and the, the way the cow places her leg and flexes her joints are, are some really important predictive signs that we, uh, we know from some of the published literature, but it's the combination of signs, the overall locomotion score or lane score that is most predictive. So if we look at this cow again and we start looking her at her repeatedly, there are a few things that we will observe, that she's actually walking with a relatively flat back and good head carriage. She's having a good look at us as she walks by. So at first impression is that she's walking fairly well, and there seems to be a reasonably even rhythm in her weight bearing, but actually you start to look more closely and the back right swings through more quickly and the back left looks stiffer because there's not as much flexion in her fetlock joint. So what we notice is the dew claws don't descend to the ground as much in the back left as in the back right. And this uh, is a really clear indication that there's a problem going on in the back left. And we can use videos as part of the training exercise to highlight some of these behaviors and to identify that actually she is tracking up pretty well. The tracking up is where the back foot lands where the front foot left off. So that's not an issue, but she is placing one uh, back left slightly narrow and one foot step and slightly wide in another. And that's because she's got a fairly significant lesion causing lameness in her back left. And the use of these videos and then picking up cow's feet to help people build the confidence that these cows do have lesions causing lameness 
is part of the whole training exercise. So I would argue that this, the standardization requires a few key things to be considered. So tra training is, is, a, is an essential thing. You, you can do a certain amount of self-training, but in order to get true standardization, you have to understand how others are perceiving those, those behaviors. And video footage really helps direct you towards the important signs, the important behaviors that are predictive of the lesions causing lameness. And then of course you need to practice and there's some indication that probably something in the order of 500 cows are required in order to get some level of reasonable consistency in identifying those behaviors and build that confidence. But at least two to 300 is probably fine in the initial um, uh, training. And then lifting the feet to help people really build that confidence that there are lesions there. And then you can go on to start doing some degree of performance benchmarking, and that could be in the form of um, quantifying sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, and positive predictive value with the level of scoring and sensitivity that you're applying to your, your, uh, your scoring. And then to guard against observer drift, then some sort of regular, and it could be annual recheck, uh, could be extremely useful. And, and the reason I think this is really important to get right is because when we look at different experts, researchers in the field, and we get them to, to do a scoring exercise using video clips, then, then if we haven't got some degree of standardization, then we're going to experience some variability. And that's to be expected. That's just part, part and parcel of the variability in which we perceive the behaviors causing lameness. And uh, I've just picked some data. This is some data that we've submitted for publication. We, we took some, some people who published in the field of, uh, of, of lameness and we asked them to observe some videos and thank you very much to all of those for participating in this and thank you to, to Ice Robotics for facilitating some of this work. And we, we've got, uh, so we, we scored over 200 cow clips in this exercise and one, one expert was down as low as 36.8% prevalence and another one as high as 58%. So we've got some variability in the prevalence um, estimates that, that would translate to some issues uh, if we're not careful. Of course, we didn't do any standardization ahead of this, this work. And I mentioned we, we can look at various performance metrics when, when we're looking at how we are scoring there are some things that metrics that we talk about quite frequently. We talk about the sensitivity. And just to remind you briefly, sensitivity is uh, looking at the true positive rate. So if we're looking at all the cows that are lame, what proportion of them are, have we correctly identified? And in this example, then four out of six cows that might be picked out at lameness scoring, um, if, if, if we missed two, then our sensitivity is going to be four out of six. If we're looking at specificity, then we're looking at the true negative rate. But from the farmer perspective, it's probably the positive predictive value that the, the farmer's really focused on. And the positive predictive value is of the cows that the scorer has found as lame or, or the system has found as lame, what proportion of those look to have lesions causing lameness. And of course, the, from the farmer perspective, they'll be looking for the classic lesions, the sole ulcers, the white lines, the toe necrosis, the things that are quite obvious to most farmers. And of course, if the farmer picks up a foot and cannot see anything other than a mild bit of sole hemorrhage, then they might, they're might they liable to think that there's a problem with the scorer. And this is something that we've really encountered. And, and sometimes the passions can be really high in this respect. Just to remind you, the last metric is overall accuracy, and that's the combination of true positive over true negative over all accounts that are scored. So the farmers expect lesions like this, the sole ulcers, the white lines, and when we look through farmer records, these are the things that predominate. What we don't see is the sole hemorrhage to, to a large degree. And my, my argument, my hypothesis is actually many of the clawhorn lesions start in some ways as sole hemorrhage, or uh, as, as we'd often describe it, sole bruising. And some of that could be explained by the, the delay that we observe between the onset of the nameless signs 
and when we see a recorded treatment. And in one study, we performed uh, this analysis and we, we found the delay between when we first saw behavioral signs of lameness to when we saw a recorded treatment, the me median time was 65 days. And, it, and these were in fairly well-managed, fairly typical dairy herds. Some instances, there was no delay. In fact, half the cows were treated um, uh, at, at around the same time. But 40% uh, of cows, the delay was two weeks. 30% of the cows, the delay was four weeks. Uh, and, and the work that, that we've done at Nottingham University would show that the a delay of two weeks can mean the difference between a cure rate of potentially 85% down to a cure rate of 15%. And so the early detection really has probably one of the biggest, most profound impacts on cure rates overall. Okay. Nick, may please uh, consider the time. <laughs> okay. Sorry. A little bit of a late start, so we, uh, my apologies for uh, having to race through this. So, so we are um, coming towards the end, but um, so re really in managing expectations, soul hemorrhage, soul bruising really has to be the, the, uh, one of the things we raise awareness to. And we need to really help our farmers by training them on detecting the early signs, the early lesions causing lameness, using all the tools in our armory. So in summary, we have, um, we have lameness scoring, which is such a valuable tool, such a valuable metric. Uh, and we have to help farmers raise their expectation that lameness uh, percentages are going to be higher than they are expecting. And that standardization can't be a self-taught exercise. We can do a certain amount of self-training, but in order to get some reasonable comparable data, we need to do some work together uh, in groups and gain some consistency that way. And then in order to ensure that we're gaining the accuracy, we really have to build the confidence in the early detection and the milder lesions, because this is where lameness is starting. Most of the time we're dealing on in, with the chronic severe end stage lesions. And then finally, in doing all of this, we really have to put a lot of emphasis on how we manage people's expectation by working with the team so that they, they know that they, they're building confidence in the data because the subjectivity of lameness scoring can mean uh, fingers get pointed in all sorts of directions. So with that, I'd, I'd like to say thank you again to uh, for the invitation to, to speak tonight. Uh, I think that's uh, that's my 20 minutes up. Uh, of course, wel welcome all the questions and I'm um, happy to answer them afterwards if we've run out of time. So thank you very much and uh, back, back to uh, your work. Okay. Nick, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, there are now, I think we have uh, about 10 minutes for general um, discussions and questions. Uh, so I think, um, is there directly a question for, for Nick? Or... There is a question. Uh... For Nick, uh, about scoring 500 cows, how much time will it take? Yeah, Every two weeks is recommended? So it, the, the fastest herd that I score on, they, they are milking at around about 370 cows an hour. And they, uh, uh, 370, 380. So th those cows are coming out quickly. Thankfully, they're not a high prevalence herd because I think I would be struggling if they were a high prevalence. So they, they, they are, they're doing a great job and they're around about seven or 8% um, lameness prevalence. There, there are other herds that are, 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 scoring, are, are milking it around. So I'm always scoring out, out of the parlor as cows are, are being milked. There'll be other herds that will be much slower. So 500 cows being milked at 200 cows an hour, you, you could you could be done in two and a half hours. So the, the, the managers that are doing this scoring, they, 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 I'd be asking them to do a, a different group each day to, so they don't get overwhelmed and, uh, and watch every cow uh, at least once a week. Okay. There is a question from Peter Rondal, very tightly connected with this one. He's asking about the automatic scoring system. Do they exist? 
Uh, are there a few commercial available systems uh, that can be used? Yeah, uh, so th this is a really exciting area of, of research at the moment. And I, I think the work done by various researchers all around the world show that the technology can find these cows. It, there's a little bit of debate is about whether humans can outperform the, the technology, but I think what the technology does is it looks every day. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the, it's that intensity of searching for the cows that's so good. The, there is no perfect system out there. Even human scorers are imperfect. And, and perhaps sometimes our expectation is that we want to find something that matches up with, with the best human scorer that we've got. And of course, uh, all the automatic systems will have their strengths and weaknesses. But uh, I've done a little bit of work with uh, Cow Alert. I've done a little bit of work with um, some, some of the, the other systems out there, camera-based systems. Uh, there's a, 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 load, a, a load cell system. And they, they all pick out cows to some degree. And, um, and I think the role of automatic lameness detection in the future will be hugely exciting and important. Thank you. Thank you. There, there is, is another. Sorry. There is another question, possibly for John, uh, regarding the stress. Uh, uh, since uh, Frank uh, van Erdenburg suggests that the laminess uh, is uh, mediated by, by by stress, so reducing the stress could be. Uh, reduce also the activity of neurons in the hypothalamus, he suggests. So maybe John can provide a reply to this question. Yeah, thank you. And I've, I've been furiously answering uh, questions in the chat as well as we've gone along. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry. Um, the, yeah, it, it's, it's of course right, but this gets us back into what is one of the most challenging aspects of, of, of lameness research, is we get back into these ever-decreasing circles of is it genetic and it's high yielding and these uh, these animal uh, is it genetic and these these animals are now predisposed to very high yields which of course put them under stress depending on the environment and and we just get into these these circular arguments of as where is where is all of this coming from and what's starting it off and i think that's what takes me back to this this idea that there is something there is a unifying theory somewhere which i think we can pull a lot of our endemic diseases uh, together into and I, I i don't know what it is i have you know i've started mulling it quite a bit now over the last few years but it's it's a it's a really complicated area but of course you're right we know that th those impacts on fertility are going to almost certainly be mediated via the hormonal impacts but of course whether it's stress milk yield genetics uh, poor quality nutrition lameness it, it, it's just very difficult to get get a starting point I see that most of the questions have been answered. Yeah, there are still. So I'm fine. I'm trying to find. Uh... There is one from Peter Rommel again. DD is considered as with low correlation to lameness. Is that because the lameness scoring skills are too poor? Can we improve our DD detection in acute cases by being better at lameness scoring? Sure, me to chip in on that one. It's uh, yeah. So. We pick up um, digital dermatitis on amiability scoring, and, and certainly when you tighten up the digital dermatitis control, it's probably the thing that makes the biggest impact to our lameness scores in a short space of time. Most of the claw lesions are, are fairly sort of chronic term lesions, uh, but, but the thing that you can make a big impact on is with your digital dermatitis control. So I think you can pick them up with lameness scoring. And yeah, of course, there are cows with lesions that don't appear on your lameness scores, but a large, a large proportion of cows with digital dermatitis will. So one more Thank question for, for, uh, for Nick, uh, because uh, your videos uh, possibly uh, raise uh, the curiosity of many participants. So is she laming? Uh, two questions are relating with this. <laughs> Uh, can, can you repeat the questions for me? But uh, I can't 
see that question. So is the question late? is from Farzane Sabohi. Uh, the question is is easy. Is the cows laming? Uh, That's, uh, oh right. So it, it so it, in, so is it the fun, fundamental question. Uh, in my opinion, yes, she is lame. Yes, uh, but it comes back to what what should we use the term lameness? So on our lameness score, she would she would be a she, she would be classified as a lame lame score. Uh, from a farmer perspective, the correlation with the term lameness seem, seems to be with the severe end of the scoring spectrum. So it, it, I'd probably be careful about talking about let, is she lame in front of a farmer audience because that, that could be highly contentious and cause a degree of upset. Of course, if I wanted to do that, then uh, you know, that, that would be the great way of doing it. So yes, she is lame, but be careful about using that term. So you replied also to Sophie Matalia, uh, to people ask the... <laughs> there is one question, how do you motivate a farmer to participate in lameness scoring without ROI from the dairy sector, increased milk price for low, for low lameness herds? Don't want to answer that one. Or... <laughs> well, Nico, Nico, shall, shall I answer it? Shall I answer it? I do, I do a costing exercise. So I run through the, the figures that John sort yeah. of alluded to earlier. Uh, you, you quickly see that the cost of lameness, it, well, while they're mostly hidden costs to the producer, are just far outweigh the, the cost of investing in someone to do the scoring for you. And the scoring doesn't have to be, it, it's not a costly exercise in relation to the cost of the disease. And, and we, spend, we invest that money in, in gathering that data for other diseases. So we, we just need to accept, we're gonna to have to gather some data for lameness and, uh, and, and that's the investment. And there's a good return on that investment if you get it right. Okay. Krista, I, I just had one comment. And yeah. Sorry for interrupting, but uh, what, what it came across to me in both Nick's and John's presentation was the value of early detection. Yeah. And to me, you know, that came across very, very strongly as opposed to uh, many of the cases, including myself, when you go on farm, you'd see we're all good at when it's too late. So mm -hmm. I guess the question for, for, for us in ICAR and also in IDF um, is how do we, how do we uh, put our energies and focus into early detection within the yeah. working group, particularly? I'm, I'm asking the question of ourselves, Chris, but I think that's probably would be of great value to our, to our farmers and our, our animals directly in early diagnosis. So I think rather than just uh, coming up with scoring for for uh for for um you know clear cases it's the early detection is to me it sounds like it's more increasingly valuable as john and uh, nick have pointed out yeah martin thank you and I, but i guess i think the other thing just reading all the questions and having answered some of them I, I guess what i would also like to highlight is is the vital importance of prevention you know a number of, mm -hmm. of participants have been sort of implying that we don't think prevention is important and of course that yeah. absolutely isn't the case yeah. i guess it's more the nature of um today's today's subject and and presentations it tends to focus us more on identification of lame animals and therefore treatment prevention is absolutely critical and we we now now have lots of good quality data about how we intervene in the different mm. systems we could spend two days talking about that in its own right. So if participants, please don't think that, that, that any of us think that prevention isn't critical because it clearly is. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Now we are, I think, uh, one, more, one more question, one or two, and then I think we are going to, to close. Um, Uh, Krista, there is one yeah. here. Which score should we count and register as lame? Two, three, four, or five, or all? Okay, so Anne Marie, it's you. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. Uh, I'm not pretending to be a lameness expert. Yeah, I would uh, transfer. I think it would. It should start from three to to look at the feet when she's uh, mildly uh, lame. But I transfer maybe the answer to to Nick or John. When, when the cow is starting to be lame, is it at the score two, three, four, or five, or all? So 
go on, Nate. You go first. <laughs> well, so uh, we we use a we use a four point mobility score in the in the UK. So uh, our, our lame score is two and a three. Um, so I, I don't have experience with using the Zimpro Spre Sprecher score, but my my interpretation is that uh, it's two two. Uh, sorry, it's uh, the, the 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 top three scores that you would uh, classify as lame. But John, John maybe you... you, you yeah, no, I, I agree. Although then when you say that and when you start putting in an intervention point, that upsets some people. And I understand why, because of course, if we're at, um, in either scoring system, at the either the, the, the score two on Sprecher or the score one on, on the other scoring systems, we can identify abnormalities. And if we can identify abnormalities, it would, in, it would suggest that there is something that we can we can do to intervene and I, I think it depends largely on the audience and what we are trying to achieve but for standard standard recording I would, I would agree with Nick. Okay so I think we are we are coming to the end I hope <laughs> it's the other time passed by very quickly and I think we could still spend some, some um, time for very interesting discussion and I think we got some ideas also for uh, probably further interesting sessions like they are on uh, prevention or uh, early detection on, uh, related to lameness. Um, I want to, to thank all of you for, for all the participants for, particip for participation. I want to thank all the speakers for their great um, and interest, very interesting presentations. And I also want to thank all the, the people and the experts and colleagues uh, who are collaborating uh, with us and we're working together. And we would like also to invite you to, to cooperate with us in the, on different topics. And if you are interested, please send an email to, to Cesare. The other things, then this is not then only, was not an only action, let's say, uh, we are we are working on this continuously and um, with IDF on, on their own welfare. So we will have the, the next webinar on this topic um, about the animal welfare, the framework for recording indicators and meeting stakeholder needs. So there we will have uh, um, presentations from OE, ISO, but also application in, in herd management uh, from Seges. So this will be on the 24th of February. Um, at, in about a week, I guess we will distribute the detailed program. And, um, and then we will have a workshop um, on the 26th of April in conjunction with the ICA meeting. It's also virtual, but it will be a half day. And it will be there, um, there, there is then the invitation also to contributions from from other uh, projects and, and initiatives and best practices. And then we also want, then we want also to work together uh, with you, how we can proceed on this way on harmonization of animal welfare parameters. Uh, this is then, um, it's, uh, it, will, it's, it, it won't be free, it's, it's a half day, it will be 50 euros. So if you register it for ICA anyway, then it's included, but if you only um, participate, there it will be 50 euros so um, I want to thank everyone and um, in in the northern or in Europe it's I wish you a good evening in New Zealand uh, John you have morning or so that the day is starting um, to have a good day and um, yeah looking forward in cooperating together on this um, uh, really interesting topics and what we have seen really important topics uh, for the farmers um, to, to get steps forward there, not only for the farmers, but also for the, for the, for the animals, also for animal welfare and uh, consumer acceptance. In this way, thank you very much and um, still the, looking forward that you participate in the next uh, webinar. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.